Hello, your friendly neighborhood professor again with another edition of This Is Your Class. Uh, regulating Healthcare Performance Part 1 is the subject of this lecture. It's probably going to go into two eight-minute mini-lectures. I'm sorry, I just can't talk that fast and try to be interesting. We're going to talk about paper performance and ethics. The, um, there's another part that's going to follow this, which is actually a standardized uh, um, um, PowerPoint lecture that's presented uh, from the lighter textbook, and I will be posting that as well. Uh, from that, I will probably have some additions, but frankly, this um, this aspect is the is the uh, the one I'm going to address directly. Uh, the other from the lighter textbook really is going to become a very important part of most of your deliverables in the class and a lot of your understanding of, of the toolkit. Uh, this is the understanding of the theoret theoretical piece behind it all. So pay for performance and ethics is, is this week's or this um, this uh, lecture's topic. We're going to start with uh, an understanding of something called the value equation. Um, the value equation is this method that's um, been around forever for assessing the value in context of quality and cost. Now the equation is simple. The value equals quality divided by cost. Now considering the fact that uh, quality is very nebulous and cost can be nebulous, guess what? Value is too. But it allows for a lot of different perspectives on value. So it allows people to assess a variety of choices uh, based on their individual needs at any given time. So for instance, consider two extremely different uh, examples, and I made them both up, um, from experience by the way. Uh, one is clinical and one is management. Uh, in the clinical example, you have a person diagnosed with pancreatic cancer who has to decide whether to go through lipid surgery. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the value of the procedure, which is possibly an extended life, is a function of the anticipated quality of life divided by the cost of the procedure. Now, the cost of the procedure include financial as well as physical, psychosocial costs, including post-op pain, uh, time spent in the hospital, risk of immediate death during surgery, emotional toll on the family, friends, neighbors, the patient, him, him or herself. Now, once the patient and the family have weighed these costs against the quality of life, then they can decide whether to go through with it. So the value, you know, the value of the outcome as a, uh, as a uh, factor uh, considering the quality of life, in this case, divided by the overall cost of that outcome. Now, the management example uh, is an ED nurse manager has to decide whether to request additional budget lines for a nurse to cover higher demand periods expected during the spring and summer. Uh, the value of having the improved nurse to patient ratio has to be weighed out against the probably, although not definitely, improved quality of care, all divided by the costs in direct monies, plus changes in staffing and skill makeup, training time, political capital that the nurse manager's got to expend in order to obtain the additional funding during the period where budgets are heavily restricted. So again, it's that value. What's the value of that new nurse uh, compared to the quality of the care that new nurse could provide divided by the costs, including political capital, which is a huge cost for nurse managers. For those of you who um, are managers, I think you can pretty much totally understand that. So as you can see from the two examples, the value equation is pretty robust. Um, although it appears uh, to be a quantitative analysis tool, it's not. It is definitely a qualitative tool. Uh, for this reason, um, very few have actually applied it to healthcare cost analysis, but that's changing fast. Uh, organizations like uh, HIMSS, the Health Information and Management System Society, uh, the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute, uh, and the Council of Medical Specialty Societies, and a whole lot more, are incorporating this value equation in their understanding of and advocacy for methods of healthcare financing. Uh, for the past several years, healthcare organizations, payers in particular, insurance companies, have been applying value-based purchasing to physician reimbursement generally and surgery payments specifically, lots of knee surgery. Uh, additionally, the um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, PPACA, health reform, you'll hear me refer to these in a, um, changing back and forth among them, uh, includes value-based purchasing as an incentive scheme for paying Medicare Advantage organizations and insurers to improve quality. 
Now, in these cases, I'm going to switch the term from quality bonus payments or quality incentives to pay for performance or P for P. Uh, now, P for P is really an interesting approach to improving quality and safety. And I've done a great deal of research in pay for performance and whether and how it works. Um, there are lots of methods for using P for P. The most prominent is to directly incentivize um, medical and surgical practices for physicians and surgeons, um, mostly physicians and surgeons. Nurse practitioners rarely get to play in this um, playground. Uh, additionally, insurers are incentivizing hospital quality and safety using pay for performance. Uh, further, health reform and the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 include language that use pay for performance to incentivize managed care organizations that act as Medi Medicare Advantage insurers uh, to improve their quality and their safety in all kinds of care under their use. The PPACA language indicates that pay for performance will ultimately affect all insurers, so anybody who is um, going to be involved in health reform at any level. There are positives and negatives to every type of policy change under the sun, uh, particularly one that involves money, um, often large sums of money in this case. Much of the published literature on pay for performance to providers suggests that the intended savings don't materialize, and that's for a number of reasons, including a lack of information on how much incentive to give and uh, whether they're incentivizing the right thing. Plus, there's disagreement over the quality measures, the definitions, the burdensome reporting, and there's considerable misalignments of incentives and rewards, such as incentivizing quality reporting over quality care, rewarding average performance, which really kind of limits the motivation, incentivizing specific targets that cause a detriment to other areas of care. So all of this is um, you know, very up in the air about what really works. Um, Rosenthal and Dudley, which I'm going to in somewhat more depth later in this part of the lecture, reported that pay for performance programs that paid as little as two dollars per patient were very effective, whereas programs paying ten thousand dollars per patient were not effective at all. So the authors cite economic theory, they state that the reward should compensate for cost of the effort and lost utility. In actuality, the point at which the investment in quality matches the incentive for quality will vary by the provider, managed care organization, intervention type, and multiple other reasons. Over the past several years, managed care organizations have initiated pay for performance programs that paid health care providers bonus payments uh, on, above their ordinary capitation rates in exchange for the providers creating initiatives like wellness plans, uh, wellness programs, uh, promoting healthy living and improvements in chronic care management. So Peterson, Woodward, Urich, Daw, and Sukin, one of the papers I read, cite examples of managed care organizations that provide pay for performance in addition to ordinary capitation rates to providers that successfully marketed annual colorectal scans to individuals over age 50, or providers that managed glycosate and hemoglobin, and hemoglobin A1C levels within a healthy range for individuals with diabetes. These types of initiatives increase costs for primary care because they require payments to the providers to provide care that they wouldn't ordinarily provide. However, these programs anticipated that the savings from quality improvements and error reductions would offset these primary care increases at the insurer. Um, I'm going to move on to another part after this.